Okay, so uh, we are now at chapter 12, uh, which is going to take a look at the beginnings of psychological research in the United States in the late 1800s, spanning into the early uh, 1900s. And it all begins pretty much here with William James. So as you recall, going back to chapter 8, um, experimental psychology as we know it officially began with, with Wundt at, the, at Leipzig in Germany in 1879. And it was actually right around the same time, roughly at the same time, that William James was uh, at Harvard. And he was, importantly here, not doing uh, psychological research. So he did not have a laboratory. So uh, at Harvard, we don't say that that was the first uh, uh, psychological laboratory in the U.S., but it was the origins of, uh, of American psychology, what William James was doing. In fact, now at, at, uh, at Harvard, the psychology building there is known as William James Hall. It's named after him. Um, and, and so James being uh, educated primarily in the US, uh, his background is primarily in British philosophy. So the story of William James's life is that his family was, they were a little eccentric. His father was somewhat eccentric and, and they, they actually traveled a lot back and forth between the US and Europe. And so he was educated in both Europe and, and in the US. But uh, in, in U.S. schools, uh, with, with uh, the U.S. being uh, a former British colony, most of the early universities uh, were uh, in the British uh, tradition and therefore taught the, the British philosophies. And so that takes us back to Chapter 5 and the empiricist stuff. So James would have been educated in people like John Locke and David Hume and Berkeley and, and also, uh, Reed, if you remember Reed's uh, common sense rebuttal to Hume, uh, this is the kind of philosophy that we might see uh, somewhat influential on some of the things William James has to say. Um, as James, as we'll see here in a couple more slides, uh, James believes that, uh, that we can sort of, to, to an extent, trust our senses, right? And that, that knowledge comes from the senses. He's definitely an empiricist. He's sometimes labeled a radical empiricist, that all knowledge derives from the senses. Um, and he, like uh, many others before him, uh, or around the same time, I should say, but we've already covered, um, was critical of Tishner. So if you recall, we have talked about the phenomenologists like Brentano and Husserl who would have disagreed with the reductionist parts of, of Tishner's work. And we all, and the same is true for the Gestaltist as well. And we're going to see similar uh, rejections of that kind of reductionism in both William James and in some of the other American psychologists who follow him. Um, but James in particular uh, had a term for what Tishner was doing. He called it the psychologist fallacy. And what it means here is he's basically thinking about what Tishner's goal is, right? His goal is that there is some sort of fundamental unit to the mind or to consciousness and that he wants to discover what that is. And James considers this to be counterintuitive. And in fact, he says only a psychologist would ever think of doing such a thing. Right? So it's, it's a, in, in James's view, it's a peculiar way of thinking that only a psychologist would think like that. Um, and so he says it leads to this fallacy of believing that it is possible to somehow take this kind of analytical scientific approach to, uh, to, to consciousness and somehow sort of strip it down into some sort of fundamental unit or an atom type, type of unit, right? Just like the physicists want to analyze matter down into its fundamental units, that's kind of what Tishner was trying to do with mind, and James says that you really can't do that kind of thing, right? You can't take the same kind of an approach. Now, as I said, James was not doing research. Right? He didn't have a laboratory, uh, but he was teaching and he was writing, importantly. In fact, he wrote what we would consider to be the first textbook in psychology, and it was called it there, the top, the principles of psychology, although uh, it had taken on the, the nickname of being the James, right? And so every, every person, every student of psychology uh, and the first, you know, from, from James on for the next 20, 30 years, they all had their own copy of the James. And uh, 
this was a massive uh, book. It was several volumes that he spent a decade writing, in which he basically, if you know, you know, there was really very little published psychological research uh, at the time, and there, there were, of course, no other books about psychology. So he kind of had to do this from scratch. He just basically just sat down and started writing about psychological phenomena of various types, covered a wide range of human behavior and human consciousness uh, topics. And certainly there's no way to cover all of the, the stuff that he mentioned in that book, but there's a few uh, pretty significant uh, things that, that we pull from James's writings that um, are worth mentioning here. And one of the arguments is free will. And so this is where we see a departure actually from uh, James uh, in, in the British empiricist education that he had. But in fact, there's a little story here that uh, James, as he was growing up, believed in determinism. He was educated in these deterministic kinds of philosophies. And this, uh, at least in part, seems to have played a role in some problem, what is most likely depression that he was experiencing. And he uh, suffered from that for, for a number of years and and, uh, and attributed it at least in part to this idea that he wasn't really even in control of his own life and that his decisions really weren't his own. And eventually, uh, as he was attempting to at some point in his uh, young adulthood recuperate in a spa in Europe, he uh, read uh, an obscure philosopher's comment that free will can be true so long as we as we believe it. And as long as we believe that we have free will, that's good enough. And this is maybe not the most compelling uh, argument. If you, if you are a determinist and you want to argue against that, it, it, you can probably say that, yeah, sure, you can believe in free will all you want, but that doesn't make it real. But this seems to have awakened something in James, and it sparked an interest in him to come back to the United States and start thinking about these topics. And of course, this really is what spurred him to get into psychology and to begin writing on these topics. And in part, the, 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 the reason it, it did influence him and inspire him really is because of his awareness of another philosophy that uh, was also coming out of the United States at the time called pragmatism. So pragmatism was invented by a guy named Charles Sanders Peirce. Peirce was uh, an unusual kind of character, uh, apparently not well liked by any of his colleagues, first at Johns Hopkins and then in other places. And, and he couldn't get, after he got fired from Johns Hopkins, he couldn't get a job anywhere. And he just sort of lived on a farm in Pennsylvania for the rest of his life. But James, on the other hand, uh, was a big fan of, of this philosophy. As James arranged various stipends to, to support his living. Um, and, and, and so this philosophy from Peirce that James was really enamored with is called pragmatism. Pragmatism means to be pragmatic, right? It means to be practical. Things that have practical value are good, right? But it, the philosophy of pragmatism also emphasizes that if you're trying to evaluate the truth of a statement, then practical value is relevant to evaluating the truth of a statement. And this is where James had the insight, going back to the free will debate, that free will is a pragmatic uh, philosophy, determinism is not. And he believed that he could use this pragmatist, pragmatist type philosophy to make an argument in favor of free will. And of course he does that, and of course he promotes pragmatism, and pragmatism becomes really a, a almost a uniquely American philosophy, right? the first really original American philosophy, because most philosophers in the United States at the universities from the late 1700s onwards to, to this time uh, were basically echoing the old British empiricist stuff and not offering much that was novel. Um, Something else that we can mention in the, in the principles of psychology is his uh, theory of emotion, the James Lang theory of emotion. You hopefully have encountered this before if you've had a motivation and emotion class, and certainly I would hope in general psychology as well. In that chapter, always in there around the middle of the book, uh, the motivation and emotion chapter. Well, what's famous about the James Lang theory is that it is the one theory that runs counter to intuition and common sense. So common sense tells us that 
um, our body's reactions uh, to an emotional stimulus are a function of our fears and our emotions in general. I use fear there as just an example. So the idea is that maybe you're hiking in the woods, you see a bear, this causes you to feel fear, and this fear then triggers your, you know, your, your fight or flight response and you're going to run away, right? Um, so that's our intuitive kind of common sense uh, theory of emotion, right? That, that I see something that, that I perceive as a threat, this causes me to feel the emotion of fear, and the fear causes me to run away. But James saw it differently. What he saw is that you perceive something that you evaluate as a threat, like a bear, but then this automatically activates your body's reactions. This causes you, your fight or flight response to kick in, your heart rate goes up, and all these kinds of things. Your respiration increases, blood pressure increases, and then you have all this physiological stuff happening, and then you run away, of course, and then it is after the physiological stuff occurs that you then experience the emotion of fear. Fear is something that occurs at the very end of the chain of events, not earlier in the chain of events. Now you might think, why, why would he propose that it works this way instead of the way it just seems intuitively? And I said earlier that he's a radical empiricist, and what's not always clear about this theory is that it is in fact an empiricist theory of emotion, right? Everything that's happening in the mind must originate from some kind of sensation and in this case, James is saying that emotions have to originate from a sensation, and that sensation is the body's physiological responses. So the idea is that for the emotion of fear, there would be a unique set of physiological uh, responses from the activity of the sympathetic nervous system that would cause that emotion in the mind. Right? And so again, the idea is that that's an empiricist theory. Now, there hasn't been a ton of empirical support. There's been a little empirical support, but one of the problems is that no one has ever found the, um, the exact pattern of physiological responses that equals uh, uh, fear as opposed to, say, some other emotion like anger. In fact, both of them can have very similar physiological responses in the body with the increase in activity of the sympathetic nervous system and the overall broad physiological arousal that accompanies that. Uh, who's the lame guy? Um, that's just a, a brief story. The interesting story here that um, when James published this idea in his, in his book, someone had pointed out to him that another author, Lang here, had already published the same idea in an obscure paper. James had never heard of this idea before and thought he came up with it on his own. Um, now, in the history of science, sometimes you have these kinds of situations where two people kind of come up with the same idea, and especially back in those days where information did not really disseminate quite so quickly as it does today, uh, it was possible that two, the same idea could be published by two different people within the span of a few years. Sometimes this led to some conflict. In fact, I think we may have mentioned back in Chapter 7 uh, about the Bell-McGindy Law, about how Charles Bell and Francois McGindy made their discoveries about the function of the dorsal and ventral roots of the spine um, and argued over who should receive the credit for that. And Charles Bell notoriously was the one who argued that he was first and he should get all the credit for it. But James was very different. Uh, James was, was contrite and he said uh, that um, even though he knew that he was a much more prominent and well-known philosopher and people were going to start calling this the William James theory of emotion, it was at his insistence that people attribute it to, to Lang instead. And so the, the, the compromise was that people started calling it the James Lang theory instead. Now last off here, the main major uh, topic I want to cover was his ideas on what we call the stream of consciousness. So he's using this metaphor of a stream or a river to describe the way our minds work. And you can kind of think of it as just, just like as a, as a stream flows naturally from, from one place to another following the path that it's, uh, of its banks. His argument is that the mind works in the same way, that our thoughts just flow one into another in a continuous fashion. And of course, if you've ever had this idea, or, or sorry, this, uh, this experience of maybe you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking about something, but then of course the topic of the conversation just kind of flows from one thing to another, and after maybe 30 minutes or so goes by, you're talking about something that seems completely different, way off topic from what you started talking about, to the point that maybe you notice it and you say, wow, how did we get on this topic? 
maybe you think about such things. If you're an introspective psychologist, maybe you would. And so it, the idea, though, is that um, th there really was a, 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 a kind of connectedness to that, right? It wasn't really just kind of totally random that your, your, top, your conversation ended up on this topic thing, but it really followed from one thing to another, and it just led you in that direction. And so James is arguing that this is the nature of consciousness, right? That our thoughts flow like this in a continuous fashion. So what this means here is that there are certain facts of consciousness that James argues we cannot ignore. First is that it is personal. What's happening in our own mind is not necessarily happening in any other person's mind. And that, of course, has a lot to do with his empiricist views that we are basically a product of our experiences, right? Everyone's led a different life with different experiences, so therefore, what we're thinking about and the way we react to things, um, that's personal. There can be, therefore, no universal structure to consciousness. And so again, we see him kind of critiquing Tishner's ideas that there is a universal structure to consciousness to be discovered. Likewise, with the next one here, he says that it's continuous and can't be analyzed. Again, of course, it was Tishner who was trying to analyze it into basic units. And, Tish and, and James says, no, it's, it, to, for something that is continuous in this way, Breaking it down into bits and pieces destroys that continuity, and therefore you're kind of losing the, the essence of what it is that you're trying to study. And again, to go back to the stream or river metaphor, um, you know, a river is continuous, right? And so would it make any sense to, to try to analyze the river down into some basic unit like, say, a molecule of H2O? Uh, and you could say, there it is, I've got this little molecule of H2O, and this is my basic unit of the river. And if I understand what the H2O is, I can understand the river. But that doesn't really follow, right? A molecule of water can be found in a, in a river, or a stream, or in an ocean, or in a lake, right? So the, the, the molecule itself doesn't tell you about the, the whole, right? and then how a river is different from an ocean, for example. So in this sense, we have to look at the bigger picture view, right? You have to take that holistic kind of view and look at the larger uh, continue, continuity of consciousness. Um, and if you recall Heraclitus, back in chapter two, he said that you can never step into the same river twice. And so if we're gonna keep using the river metaphor to talk about the mind, then again, we would say the mind is never the same twice. Right, that, that what's going on in our minds now uh, is something that will never be reproduced. Obviously, we can have memories, right? We can remember things from the past, but the, the idea is that that particular experience of remembering something is not a, it doesn't create an identical experience as to when it was happening to you uh, itself. And of course, that might mean, for example, that um, uh, lots of things have happened in between the original memory and the time you recall it. So, of course, your thoughts and your, your, your reactions and your feelings about past events can change over time. So, again, the idea is that for someone like Tishner trying to continuously uh, present these kinds of images to people in, in his experiments and reproduce certain kinds of findings over and over again, and of course, people had some difficulty reproducing what Tishner was doing, and James would say it's because you can't really reproduce an experience. And lastly, here we see an influence, perhaps from Wundt, this idea of selectivity, right? So remember, Wundt is interested in the will, and he's studying the shifting of attention, like in his thought meter experiment. And so that's an example of selectivity, is that we can select certain things to tend to and to think about, and then we can shift that to something else. And so this is an active theory of mind here, uh, that we can actively select what we want to think about and what we want to uh, uh, do. And of course, remember, James is arguing for free will, so these are, these are our free choices here. Something else I want to say about the whole stream of consciousness, is, which also might help um, kind of capture the idea of what what this metaphor means is that following James and his ideas about this uh, con concept, there was in fact a literary movement called the Stream of Consciousness uh, uh, writing style. Uh, it's worth noting that William James's brother was Henry James, who was a famous novelist, though he did not necessarily write in the Stream of Consciousness style. But 
I've selected Willa Cather, who most definitely uh, did, in fact, was probably one of the most well-known and important of the stream of consciousness writers. And I just pulled this quote from a random thing that I found online, but it just kind of captures what the stream of consciousness literature movement is like, but it also helps us get a sense of what uh, James, James means by the stream of consciousness. So let me just read it real quick here. Went up to the bathroom on the second floor where there was only a painted tin tub. The taps were so old that no plumber could ever screw them tight enough to stop the drip. The window could only be coaxed up and down by wiggling and the doors of the linen closet didn't fit. He had sympathized with his daughter's dissatisfaction, though he could never quite agree with them that the bath should be the most attractive room in the house. He had spent the happiest years of his youth in a house at Versailles where it distinctly was not, and he had known many charming people who had no bath at all. However, as his wife said, if your country has contributed one thing at least to civilization, why not have it? Many a night after blowing out his study lamp, he had leaped into the tub, clad in his pajamas, to give it another coat of some one of the many paints that were advertised to behave like porcelain, and didn't. So one thing that you note here is that when you read this kind of passage, there's really not a lot of pausing, right? There's just uh, continue, there's this continuity going on here. But notice also that how the this this is flowing from from image to image and thought to thought, right? It begins with um, a description uh, of the bathroom, and then it goes to this to, to our this person here. Um, who uh, begins to think about uh, his daughter's opinions about it. And then he remembers his youth. And then he thinks about what his wife has said about it. And then we get uh, a memory of, of um, what he's done in the past to try to fix it up. And so it's just jumping from one memory and one thought uh, to another with no particular order. But of course, that's the nature of the way consciousness works. Moving on here. Uh, I want to talk about the next major character in this chapter, who is Hugo Munsterberg. And so, uh, as mentioned, James was not really running a laboratory, and uh, he had what we would call maybe a demonstration lab of sorts that uh, wasn't really for research purposes, but was just for demonstrating and teaching. And he wanted someone to come in and be more of an active researcher. So he wanted to hire a second faculty member to come in to, to, to be part of the Harvard Psychology Department. It was just, really just William James at the start. Also, William James, after his uh, first several years there, began to turn more towards philosophy and spirituality. He, he wrote more about pragmatism and, and religious experiences and, and stuff later in his career. So he wanted to have somebody else kind of take the reins of psychology. And so that person became Hugo Munsterberg here. Now he was a student of Wundt's, and one of his main uh, research focuses was in applied psychology. And in fact, we might consider him to be something of a pioneer in that area that not really people weren't doing very much applied psychology. Um, now he was not, I have listed there three kinds of applied psychologists. He was not a psychotherapist, but he recognized that psychotherapy was a way in which we could apply psychological knowledge, right, knowledge about how the mind works. Uh, to help people with problems. And he was also aware that there were at the time people like Sigmund Freud and Pierre Genet who were doing exactly that sort of thing. And in fact, Munsterberg was a bit of a fan of Freud and actually arranged for him to travel to the United States and deliver some lectures. Forensic psychology also had its origins around this time frame, though Munsterberg didn't do much in that domain. And that's, you know, psychology as it's applied to law. Um, and but industrial psychology, which is represented by the more current modern fields of ergonomics and human factors, um, that's something that Munsterberg was working in. He was looking at things like uh, productivity in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a workplace environment, for example, and what kinds of factors can be used to improve performance and reduce errors and things of that nature. Now, he was also a little bit of a controversial political figure here, as I'm mentioning. And, and I just like to tell this story a little bit because it, it kind of it really represents what happens to, to Munsterberg. Uh, that um, so you know, he came from Germany and just prior to the onset of World War One, and of course as the war broke out in in Europe, what was happening, if you recall from your history lessons of World War One, is that. Uh, the, the Archduke uh, Ferdinand uh, was uh, assassinated by a Serbian activist, and um, 
uh, this triggered a, a treaty, it broke a treaty, right, that triggered a declaration of war between the countries. And then, of course, there were all these various treaties between all these many countries in Europe, between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, the, uh, and Germany and, and all these countries. And so one by one, each of these tre treaties begins to be activated, and they end up all at war with each other, which is why it began to be called a world war. Um, but the United States at the time was very much uh, against having treaties, right? Treaties were like an obligation that we would have to engage in a war, and no one really wanted to be in, in a, such, a, such a treaty, and we didn't have any treaties at the time. So there was a big debate at the time, right? We had countries uh, like England and France, for example, who were uh, allied with us, and we, they, were, they were allied countries, and they were involved in this war, and some people were saying that we should join the war to help out those, those other countries, those allies. And then other people were making the argument that this was a, a, a European problem and that we should let the Europeans settle, settle it and not get involved. And this was known as the Hawks versus Doves debate leading into World War I. Now Munsterberg, coming from Germany, was aware that uh, if the United States entered the war, it would be on the side of England and against Germany and that this would increase the chance that his home country could end up suffering a serious defeat and and be destroyed in the war. And so he argued that the U.S. should stay out of it. And then people began to say, hey, who is this uh, German guy over at Harvard who's uh, saying all these kinds of things? Is he some sort of German spy? And so, of course, he started to begin to receive death threats and all kinds of uh, uh, criticism, which apparently caused him a great deal of stress. He didn't really mean to be so, so controversial and so, so upsetting. Uh, and in fact, uh, Munsterberg ended up dying while delivering a lecture, apparently suffering a, a heart attack, perhaps triggered by all of, at a fairly young age, perhaps triggered by all of the stress that we may never know exactly. So if he loved Germany so much, how, why did he even stay in Germany? Why did he come to the U.S. in the first place? And here's the answer for that. Um, Munsterberg got in trouble with, with Wundt in particular. So he was, as, as I mentioned, he was a student with, with uh, Wundt, right, D doing his doctoral dissertation there at Leipzig. Uh, but what he was going on here is that he, what was going on is that he was doing this research um, where he was trying to answer this question. How do we know what our bodies are doing? Right? How do I know, you know, if my arm is fully extended like this, how do I know that my, I'm sticking my hand out like that? Well, one obvious answer is that I can feel it, right? And that we may have what we call proprioceptive uh, receptors embedded in the muscles, tendons, and joints that tell you about the position and movement of your arms. We call that proprioception and kinesthesis now. But the existence of those receptors was not known in this time frame, and therefore there was still some criticism that maybe this is not how we know this. Instead, of course, one's argument is that the will has to be in charge of everything, right? That's a big part of his volunteerism is the will. And so the will says, I'm going to send my heart, arm out there. I'm going to reach out there, right? So the will was the one who said, I'm making the commands in the brain to send the commands to the arm and tell it what to do. So the will can simply just remember what it did, right? And this is called motor discharge or corollary discharge. What this means is that the, 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 the motor signal or the motor discharge signal that's sent to the muscles um, is saved. Right, and that's a form of memory, right? And therefore, knowing that my arm is fully extended like this is really just something that I know because I remember telling my arm to do that, right? And that's the, that's the job of the will, is to control the body and to remember what's going on. Um, and when Munsterberg did his studies, he found that this was not correct, that uh, that it's better explained by actual sensory feedback from the muscles, not from any form of a corollary motor discharge idea. And Wundt's reaction was, that must be wrong. You, you can't, we're, I'm not going to accept that as a dissertation. So then he had to put that, all that work aside and he had to do a completely different project to, uh, to be credited for his dissertation uh, and receive his doctoral degree. But then, of course, after having received the doctoral degree, he realized he had this old data and that he decided he would publish it because, in his view, it was perfectly good work. It was, it was fine. In fact, it was. Um, but this 
ended his potential for working in Germany anymore because not only did he then cross Wundt, who was very angry with him, but all of the other schools in Germany were, were already staffed by former Wundt students and therefore they would not hire him because essentially he, he, they didn't want to cross Wundt either. So he was effectively blacklisted and didn't have very many options. And uh, when William James heard of the story, it actually caused him to uh, like Munsterberg. It, he thought this was a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a sign of integrity that uh, he wanted to hire Munsterberg uh, to, at Harvard. And that's how he ended up at Harvard. Now I've been saying over here that uh, James didn't have a laboratory, and that so the first psychological laboratory was not at Harvard, uh, and that is at least in the U.S. And that's because it was here at Johns Hopkins University, founded by Granville Stanley Hall. And so Hall had actually studied some philosophy and psychology with William James, but of course because there was no research happening there, uh, and he wanted to get the research education in psychology, he then left Harvard and traveled to Leipzig just to get a degree under Wundt. In fact, he was the first American uh, to do so. And uh, therefore, he was really the, technically the first American to get a PhD in psychology. Um, and then he returns to the U.S., to Baltimore there, where he creates the psychology department and laboratory at Johns Hopkins University in 1883. Um, now, it's also important to, to mention, though, that uh, Johns Hopkins cannot currently claim to be the oldest continuously operating laboratory because he closed it down. Five years later, uh, he was offered the job of being president of Clark University at Worcester, Massachusetts. And so he left Johns Hopkins to, uh, to, be, to be the president of Clark University and to also continue psychological research and he created the psychology program at Clark and, at, at the same time. And so Hopkins went, for, went a couple of years without having any psychology program at all. So that means the, the, it, the second laboratory in the country would have the claim of the oldest continuously operating lab. So who is the second laboratory? Well, that's the subject of some debate. So, uh, one argument is my alma mater, Indiana University. The other argument is the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, those two schools both claim to have the oldest continuously operating lab. And there are differing arguments about the exact dates these, these departments were created. So it's not quite clear who's right and who's wrong. Now, why was Hall recruited to be the president of Clark University? Because he was known for his administrative abilities, and so he's considered what we'll call the great organizer in psychology. So in his career, he recognized that, you know, in the first few years after he set up the lab at Johns Hopkins, that there were people at these other schools, right? It was, as I mentioned, Indiana and uh, University of Pennsylvania, but of course there was Harvard but also Columbia University in New York, Chicago University, University of Wisconsin, uh, Cornell University was where Tishner was at. All of these schools were, were uh, starting psychology programs at the time, and Princeton too. And um, so he recognized that, oh, you know, we've got this growing thing. We've got a bunch of people doing psychological research. We should have a, a, an organization, right? And so that was the APA, the American Psychological Association, so that they would have an annual meeting where they can present their work, right, a conference. And then, um, so of course he became not only a founder of that, but was the first president of the APA. And so for this and various other sort of things, he was seen as a great administrator and organizer, and that was one of the main reasons he, he became president of Clark University. Now, in terms of his actual research, his psychological research, part of what he was doing, maybe a minor part, was uh, discrediting these uh, para parapsychological th ideas, right? So this was a big thing in the mid to late 1800s, and especially in the American Northeast, that uh, there were lots of, of psychics making a lot of money, uh, holding seances and, 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 and this kind of stuff. And this was becoming a big deal, and people were, uh, take, a lot of people were taking it very seriously. And so therefore people started to think, hey, if this is real, that we should start to study it and that these psychologists at these universities should be studying this stuff too. But Hall, as well as William James, believed that this was all fraudulent. And, and they knew that they didn't really want to include this kind of stuff in their research because they were trying to make psychology scientific and to get away from all of the philosophical, metaphysical questions 
that uh, had plagued the, the psychology before it became more scientific. And so they, they spent time sh sort of showing how these kinds of, of practices uh, were, were in fact fraudulent so that they could say, no, we don't have to study this. Actual psychological research is that he was a pioneer in developmental psychology. So he was really one of the first to study uh, development, both in humans and in other animals, doing kind of some comparative analysis there. He also pioneered the study of adolescence and aging, senescence, right, late adulthood. Now, when I say he's the great organizer, there's a, a long list of firsts that he's associated with here. So as mentioned, he's the first to get a, a PhD from uh, at, in Harvard's philosophy department, and also the first to get a psychology PhD, right? And as, as mentioned, the first American to study with Wundt. Pioneer in developmental psychology, first lab, first APA president. Also, after creating the APA, he wanted to, he, he realized that we should have a journal. Uh, to publish these studies that all these researchers are doing. So the American Journal of Psychology was created. Uh, that's the first psychology journal published in the English language. Clearly there were already some German uh, psychology journals. And as mentioned, he was actually the first president of Clark University. Clark University was founded then in 1888, and he became the president of that school. Next up is James McKinney Cattell, who created that laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania I mentioned earlier. He had actually studied with Hermann Lotz, if you remember him, back in Chapter 6 at Gottingen University, and then had studied with Wundt and even with Hall before finishing with Wundt. So when he, he establishes the lab at Penn, he's doing reaction time studies. And in fact, we mentioned him in Chapter 11 because he was the one, along with his student, who attempted to show that there were, in fact, no really good correlations between these reaction times and psychophysical studies and intellectual skills, right? So um, he, his work kind of was important in showing that intelligence tests should not include measures of reaction time, physical and sensory skills, psychophysical measurements, and so forth. Now, one thing we might also wonder here is, Everyone that we've talked about, both in this chapter and pretty much everyone, um, almost everyone pr prior to this chapter, uh, are white males. So where's everyone else? Well, part of the issue, of course, is that historically uh, minorities and women were excluded from, uh, from participating in sciences and in, 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 uh, the universities in general. Right? So you, the, in the earliest universities uh, were white only and it wasn't until the late 1800s that there began to be uh, what were known as the, the black only schools, right? These are now known as the historical black universities. Um, and Francis Sumner is here the, the first African American to receive a psychology PhD and he was actually studying with Hall at Clark University. Um, and in his career, after he got his PhD, uh, he began to work at those at those black only schools. His first his post was at the West Virginia Collegiate Institute. And it was while he was there that he wrote um, a controversial set of papers. Um, so in the 1920s, there was a movement afoot to integrate higher education, right? Instead of having the white only schools and the black only schools, people were arguing for integration. Um, and, and Francis Sumner wrote these controversial papers, in fact, arguing against desegregation, right? He, he actually wrote that, the, that this would not work because of the, the black Americans were on a lower cultural level than white Americans. And so it, was, it seemed to be a, a strange thing for him to, to actually say. Um, but more recent papers, looking back over not just what Sumner published, but also his, his personal correspondence with others, reveals that he didn't actually believe that. that. He didn't believe what he was saying, but what he understood was that in the 1920s, the desegregation movement was doomed to failure, that it was too soon for that to work. There was too much um, uh, sentiment against it. And so his claim is that this would be too divisive and that it would harm the, uh, the, these black only colleges and so that it would be better to uh, keep them separated so that we could improve the quality of the programs at those schools. And in fact, that might seem to have paid off because he later moved to Howard University and created the psych program there. Uh, 
Howard University is seen as one of the most prestigious schools in the country, and for most of the 20th century, its psychology department was one of the most important psychology departments in the country. So he seemed to have done something there. And in fact, what's most important here is that at Howard, uh, one of his first doctoral students was Mamie Phipps, later Mamie Phipps Clark. Um, Mamie Phipps did what's known as the doll study, which, in which she, she gave uh, dolls to black children and white children, and these dolls were of course either of black babies or white babies, and they uh, were asked to describe and interact with the dolls. And what they found is that both the, 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 the black and the white children in the study uh, exhibited knowledge of the negative racial stereotypes. And she then used this to make the argument in the paper that racial stereotypes harm children and child development. Um, and it was, in fact, this study was cited directly in Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka that, um, that was used as part of the, of the, of the decision to, um, to, to end uh, the, the segregation of schools. So, in fact, the long-term plan of Sumner seems to have worked out, that by uh, creating stronger programs at Howard, for example, and then mentoring Mamie Phipps to do this research, she then plays a big role in the desegregation of higher education. Later, Mamie Phipps marries Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark was the, the first uh, African-American to be president of the APA. As for the women, uh, women were allowed, in many cases, to attend schools, to attend colleges and universities, but they were usually excluded from the sciences. They were only accepted into what are known as the allied professions, like teaching and nursing. Um, there were some women academics, but they all had sort of unofficial appointments, because usually they would end up being married to, say, a professor, and uh, they may be able to kind of unofficially do, do research and, uh, and take classes even. Um, because of that kind of connection. Um, and some of that happens in psychology too, but also it happened in all the other sciences. Um, but first off, we have Margaret Floyd Washburn, who was the first woman to get a psychology PhD, and she was doing that with uh, Tishner at Cornell, right? And so we know what Tishner was doing. Um, Tishner, it should be worth mentioning, it uh, should, does not really shouldn't receive much credit for, for this because uh, he was actually against it. He, he did not want her to attend. He considered women to be a distraction in the laboratory. Um, but the president of Cornell University, Ezra Cornell, sort of overrode that decision. He was, Cornell's mission for the university was that it was a place where anyone, anybody can come to study anything. And when Washburn says, I want to come there and study psychology, Tishner says, no, but Ezra Cornell, the president, said yes. And of course, his decision uh, was, the, was the winner. I really like the story here of Mary White and Crockett still. She studied with William James. So she was actually a professor of philosophy at Wellesley College, which was a girls' school. She had studied philosophy. She was then teaching philosophy at Wellesley. Wellesley wanted to start offering psychology classes. And they, of course, uh, asked Mary White and Crockett to do that. But she said, you know, I only know this philosophy stuff, and not too far away, we've got William James over at Harvard who is teaching psychology stuff, so why don't you let me go study with William James, and then I'll come back and I'll teach the psychology classes that you want me to teach here at Wellesley. And so she did. Uh, but, of course, Harvard was male only at the time. William James didn't mind, and he said, sure, yes, come and take my classes, but president of Harvard University refused. And this shows a difference in James's power at Harvard versus Tishner is that James basically said, I don't care what you say, I'm accepting her anyway. And then what happened is that all the male students in James's class uh, resigned in protest for that whole year. And this ended up calling Mary Calkins to uh, have a basically a personal one-on-one -on -one tutorial in psychology from William James for a year. So not too bad. Um, but of course, she was only there in an unofficial context, right? She was not officially accepted to the university. She was an unofficial student. She did research, so she uh, actually did the work that would be uh, worthy of receiving a PhD. Um, but of course, she could not get a degree from uh, from her from her. Um, she didn't really care too much. Uh, she she just went back to Wellesley and resumed her career. But what happened is that 
her her uh, doing this kind of started to break down barriers for women at Harvard, and so other women following in her footsteps also began to take classes with Harvard faculty as unofficial students. And this got to be such a, a large number of women that they had to create a separate kind of, of building essentially across the street from the Harvard campus in Cambridge, Mass, uh, that they called the Harvard Annex. And so this was basically a place where women were taking unofficially Harvard classes. Uh, at this, after some years, the Annex was incorporated to be an actual school, Radcliffe College. And that's when Radcliffe College gave her a gave Mary Calkins a PhD uh, for her work, um, although she really didn't want to accept it because she saw the existence of Radcliffe as just a way for Harvard to continue to exclude women. Uh, and in fact, there seems to be some evidence that she was correct because Harvard and Radcliffe remained separate until 1963, and that's when uh, Harvard University no longer Harvard College, but now Harvard University incorporated Radcliffe College as one of its colleges within the university. And that was then the point where women were officially admitted to Harvard University as opposed to Radcliffe College. Um, and in fact, nowadays, Radcliffe is the name of the Harvard Institute for Women and Gender Studies. So that entire, that entire institute, uh, to some extent, owes its uh, existence to, to Mary White and Coffins. Um, worth mentioning, Ethel Puffer Howes also was at, there at Harvard and was studying uh, as part of uh, the Harvard Annex and then Radcliffe College um, with William James and Hugo Munsterberg as well. And uh, again, uh, Harvard wouldn't give her a degree despite Munsterberg pushing hard for it because Munsterberg had made the claim that, that her work, Ethel Puffer Howes' work, was the strongest uh, research that he had ever supervised. But instead, she got her degree from, from uh, Radcliffe. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that women married to uh, university professors sometimes got, got their careers this way. And that's true of Christine Ladd Franklin, who actually precedes everyone that we've talked about so far. She was uh, doing this stuff in the 1870s and 1880s before uh, 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 Washburn and Coffins and others. Uh, she was married to a Harvard math professor named Fabian Franklin. Or not, not Harvard, I'm sorry, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and in fact, during one of their trips to Germany, she had traveled to, study, to, to meet with uh, Hermann von Helmholtz. And Helmholtz had uh, a theory we haven't talked about in this class, a, a theory of how color vision works. And that's exactly what Christine Ladd Franklin was studying, was color vision. And then after that, she developed her own theory of color vision and did research in that area. And John Hopkins finally decides 44 years later, when she's old and gray, to offer her a doctoral degree. I also like to mention real quick here the story of Eleanor Gibson, Eleanor Jack Gibson. The, the Gibson here is the same as the James J. Gibson of our chapter 10, though her career did not occur because she was married to him. Um, she had her own separate career. but. She, was, she had difficulty getting accepted, right? So she was applying to graduate schools in the 1930s. She was rejected at Yale and other schools, and she was eventually accepted by the behaviorist, Clark Hull. We'll talk about him in the chapter 13 notes for behaviorism. Um, but the reason I mention this is that Eleanor Gibson is probably the most important developmental psychologist of the 20th century. Maybe, you know, maybe Piaget is, is at the top there, but she's certainly right up there as one of the most important developmental psychologists of the 20th century. But despite that, despite her significance in the field, she, as mentioned, had trouble even getting into graduate school in the first place. So we see how many others were perhaps significant who did not get in. Now to finish up these notes, I want to talk about something else here, rather than these historical issues about the major characters, but um, what's, what was the actual research happening in American psychology? I mentioned all these programs were created at Johns Hopkins and Penn and Indiana and Chicago and Columbia and Princeton and Harvard and so forth, so was there a school of thought here? Were they doing German type psychology like volunteerism? No, they were doing what we label right here as functionalism. So let's take a look. We're going to go back here and talk about Tischner yet again. 
Teshner was being a reductionist, right? He's, he's trying to break consciousness down into these basic bits and pieces, primary elements, right? He doesn't want to talk about the content or meaning of conscious experience, right? He called that the stimulus error. And I'm using this analogy here of saying that to, to, to an extent, he's, he's attempting to do a dissection of the mind, right? Chop it up into bits and pieces. And for no particular reason, I've, I've used this picture of, a, of an amoeba. And the idea is that we could dissect the amoeba, right? There's the whole amoeba, but we could, we could dissect it. We could cut it up and we could remove all of the various parts, like the nucleus and the vacuoles and, and a section of the cell membrane and lay them out on a slide and you could look at them. And I could say, there it is, there's your amoeba. amoeba. I've labeled all of its parts, all of its elements, all of its bits and pieces, and there it is. And, that's what, and so now you know what the amoeba is, right? Well, not necessarily, right? It doesn't tell you what an amoeba is. If you never had seen a living amoeba in its natural environment doing whatever it is amoebas do in that natural environment, you certainly wouldn't know what this kind of organism was just by looking at its parts, right? And so, that analogy is where the functionalists kind of come in because they're basically saying it doesn't help to study parts, you, especially in isolation. If you just dissect them and cut them out and look at them by themselves, right, you have to understand how parts interact with other parts, right? And that, of course, relates to the function, functioning of those parts, right? What do they do, right? Um, and of course, in order to understand what an organ does, what its function is, you have to look at it in the living organism, uh, whole and intact, functioning in its natural environment. Uh, and so to go back to psychology here, the idea is that to understand mind, right, we can't try to break it up into bits and pieces, but what we have to do is we have to understand how the different parts might work in relation to each other. What is their function? How do they interact? And of course this means looking at, at the functioning of the mind in its natural context, which means interacting with the world, right? The idea, of course, is that we live in a world in which we have to do things, right? We have to find shelter, find food, find mates, right? Achieve various goals and avoid dangers. And the function of the mind is to regulate and guide and monitor this behavior, right? And, and so that's the argument from the functionalist school, right? So we would say this is the first American school of thought in psychology. It's inspired by William James. You might see sometimes history books say that James is the founder of functionalism, but that's not true. Um, but James was certainly a, a, a large inspiration for it as well, the pragmatic stuff, right? Because this, you might think that functionalism is a, is a very pragmatic school of thought. Um, and so we have these quotes from some of the functionalists, like you can't study the parts of the mind in isolation. You have to understand function to understand what's going on here. It's a much more holistic approach, not breaking it down. The true founder of functionalism is on this next slide, John Dewey. John Dewey wrote a paper called The Reflex Art Concept in Psychology. And part of what he's doing in this paper is he's making an argument uh, against um, the reductionist approaches to, to psychology. If you go to the website, um, which is linked on the web courses for uh, classics in the history of psychology, you can read this paper. You can also read a lot of work from um, from William James as well as uh, some of the people we've mentioned, such as uh, Mary Calkins and Washburn's dissertations. Anyway, uh, what, what Dewey is talking about, uh, uh, his, his critique of the reductionist approaches, he's, he's talking about reflexes. And so one way to think about a reflex is to think about uh, Usually we think of the reflex as being a stimulus followed by a response, and then we have this uh, stimulus arrow response, right, as the way to capture that, or sometimes we just abbreviate S and R, so S arrow R. And one of the things Dewey remarks is that it's not really possible to, to talk about a stimulus and talk about a response as if they are two separate things, right, because the, the word stimulus itself implies to stimulate something, to cause something to happen. It's a cause, right? And response is an effect, right? And you can't talk about response without talking about what caused it to occur, right? So that is, it makes no sense to talk about a stimulus without talking also about the response to it. And it makes no sense to talk about the response without talking about what causes it, the stimulus, right? And so this is basic cause and effect. And you can't have cause without an effect. You can't have effect without a cause. 
And this means then that when it comes to analyzing reflexive behavior, you can't break it down into individual stimuli and individual responses. You have to look at the stimulus response connection as a whole unit of analysis, right? So in this case, you can't be reductionist. You have to look at the holistic, bigger picture view, right? He's looking at the child candle reflex, which you imagine a child seeing a candle and having some curiosity, but they reach out to touch it. They don't know that it's going to burn, but they feel the pain and they pull their hand back. And so now that's the stimulus response is the flame followed by withdrawing the hand. Um, but Dewey's arguing that it's, e it's even bigger than that, right? It's more than just those two things, but it's really the whole idea that this is a, this is a coordinated propulsive action, that the child sees the candle and experiences curiosity and tries to touch it, and then experiences the pain and then pulls their hand back. So this is a whole coordinated action that, uh, that uh, can, when understood at that level, we understand the meaning of the experience. So to sound like a phenomenologist like a Searle, we want to understand what's the meaning of the experience. And the meaning of the experience is don't touch the flame, right? So for Dewey, before we get the word functionalism, he uses this other word, instrumentalism. He says that the mind is like an instrument, right? So when it comes to the reflex arc, the stimulus and the response, sometimes when we think about reflexes, we think of them as being totally mindless, right? Just automatic and involuntary. But for Dewey, they are still governed by the mind. Right? And the mind here plays a role in, in mediating these reactions to our environment. Because we have to remember, right? I touch the, 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 the candle, I feel pain, and my hand pulls back. Um, but then I, uh, that's more than just the reflex, but I, I remember what that's like. So that the next time I see a candle, I know better, right? I've learned about the consequences of my actions, and I know not to repeat this behavior. So therefore, I know never to touch a flame again. And that's where the mind comes in. Dewey, say, Dewey says that that's the function of the mind. The mind is like a tool or an instrument that we wield to help us adapt to our environment, right? And so here we're seeing a really strong Darwinian influence, and this is part of the way we covered the Darwin stuff in the previous chapter, is that this is an influence on the functionalist school, is that it's about helping us, the mind, its existence itself is about helping us adapt to our environment. And part of that is about learning the consequences of our actions. Another major figure in functionalism is James Roland Angel. A quote from him there is that structure means nothing if we don't know the function. Again, everyone wants to pile on with Tishner here, and that's what he's doing. They're saying, don't study structure. We need to study function. So he also talked about mental operations, right? We want to understand what's, what are the operations that the mind engages in, right? And we could list them. Like we could talk about things like perception and attention or what we call apperception and memory, reasoning, problem solving, language, decision making, right? On and on we can go with all of the various mental operations. So what are their functions? What do they do? Uh, what do we use the mind for? So this idea of, that he has of creating a job description for the mind, right? What is the mind really doing here? You know, nowadays people will talk about the, the mind as a, something like an information processor, a computer, a digital computer. This was, of course, well before such things as digital computers existed. So Angel's idea, maybe the better metaphor, uh, is to think of the mind something like a Swiss army knife, right? You've got all these different little tools that you can pull out to do various things with. And the mind is kind of cobbled together like that. Right, that there's, it's really a collection of a bunch of different specialized tools, and we need to figure out what are those, right? That's the goal of psychology, is to figure out what all the various functions of the mind are. But common theme, connecting to Dewey, Angel says that the mind mediates between the needs of the organism and the environment. So the idea is that the organism has needs like food and shelter. The environment offers those things. But of course, it, the organism requires a mind to help it find those things and, and obtain those things in the environment. And that's exactly what Harvey Carr is talking about, this is the idea of a, a adaptation or attunement to the environment. And he talks about the adaptive act. Behavior in the mind helps us adapt to the environment, again, in a very strict Darwinian sense. And Carr defines the adaptive act as these three things, the motivating stimulus, a sensory situation and a response. The motivating stimulus is something like hunger, right? So the sensory situation is what we previously called a stimulus, right? That's the input to the to the mind, right? 
and looking out on an environment. Um, and then, given a particular internal, right, so the sensory situation is external input, the motivating stimulus is the internal input. So, given a particular environment as the sensory situation, if I have a particular internal state like I'm hungry, I take those two things and I say, okay, somewhere out there in this environment there's something that will satisfy that. There's food. And so now I need to be able to engage in some sort of a response that will enable me to navigate my environment, find food, and satisfy the motivating state of hunger. So squirrels, for example, bearing nuts for the winter, again, in the middle of the winter, they are um, hungry, and they're in an environment where they know there are lots of caches of nuts out there, so they, of course, know how to navigate their environment to recover and find them. and and eat them, right? And so this is all an adaptive act, right? So here we see a little bit of comparative psychology, right? That this that uh, this this explanation of behavior is true of squirrels, but it would also be true of humans, right? That we can compare uh, uh, behavior across species like that. So this idea of motivation is echoed by another major functionalist, uh, Woodworth, right? He wants to talk about uh, how these internal motivational processes actually trigger behaviors, right? And this is where we get the concept of a drive, right? You might have heard of this in drive in motivation theory before. So the whole school of thought of the psychology of motivation and how that works, motivated behaviors and drives, it really begins with Woodward. Um, so in this case, the idea is that um, he's capturing this idea that the mind mediates between the stimulus and the response by using this, uh, what we call here, the SOR chain. The O stands for the mind of the organism, right? So the, the more reductionist, uh, kind of even behaviorist approach is what we call the SR chain, where it's just stimulus and response without a mind uh, to guide anything. But the O in between, for Woodworth, represents how we use the mind to mediate between the stimulus and the response. So there's a stimulus, I have to decide, am I going to respond to the stimulus or am I not going to respond? And if I do respond, exactly what response should I engage in? So there's a deliberative process of sorts happening here, and that's where the mind's important. And of course, part of that is to satisfy our motiva motivated states, right? So if I'm hungry, that's a motivated state, and then it causes me to perform various responses, right? And that's what we call drives, right? A drive is, a, is the way in which motivation drives behavior, that is, it controls behavior. So what happens to functionalism? Well, functionalism ends up being replaced with behaviorism. And part of the reason for that is that we might think that there's a hint of, of unscientific, perhaps metaphysical, dualistic kinds of thinking in the way the functionalists uh, write and talk, right? So they use a lot of mentalistic terms like motivation uh, and other kinds of mental states that all are associated with the O in the SOR chain, right? Uh, and we haven't talked about a few other ones like Thorndike. Well, I'll talk about Thorndike in the, in the next chapter, but Thorndike's law of effect was a functionalist approach to learning as well, right? We learn the consequences of our actions, uh, as, as Dewey had emphasized. But in particular, Thorndike talks about rewards, right? Rewards imply that the animal has a goal. It wants something. And if it performs some actions that allow it to get what it wants, that's rewarding. And so getting what you want, that's a reward. So, uh, and that's, that's how we learn, right? We learn to repeat those things that help us get what we want. And that's what Thorndike described as the law of effect. Um, but how can, I, how can I really know what an animal wants? Can I really see their desires in, in their mind? And, and so there's a, there's, there is a little hint of, of the problem of other minds and this kind of dualistic kind of thinking here. Um, and so motivation, wants and desires and rewards, all of these things may be somewhat dualistic and unscientific. And of course, if we're getting into that, we are faced with difficult problems like interactionism. And I'm asking whether that's pragmatic, because maybe with the idea here is that the functionalists didn't care that uh, there, there was a, perhaps a mind-body problem in their psychology because they didn't consider those philosophical questions to be very practical. And they didn't worry about them. But some people did worry about them, right? And when we get to behaviorism, which is really in the next chapter, but I'm kind of setting up the transition here, uh, 
that I'm going to make the arguments that maybe we don't need to invoke the O between the S and the o, R to explain behavior, right? We can't see it, we can't observe it, so therefore it's not necessarily scientific, and we might be better off without it. And so I have kind of tracing here on this slide a, a mapping of how psychology transforms. When we look at the old German psychology, whether it's structuralism or phenomenology or any of that kind of stuff, if we want to use that symbol O to describe the mind, um, then we could say that, that that kind of stuff was a pure O psychology, right? The, 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 the German school of thought of various types, structuralism, phenomenology, gestalt psychology, they were all just interested in conscious experience without regard to the outside world. It was almost, in a sense, a kind of solipsistic kind of, of psychology, which makes sense given the dualistic rationalist history there. What the functionalists did was they tried to adopt the more empirical materialist thing by saying that the mind actually has to be part of our environment, right? It's part of the body. It helps us adapt to our environment. So we're giving mind an environmental context, right? So we're placing the mind in between the stimulus, which is the environment, and the response, which is the body. And it's part of all of that stuff, right? It's part of the environment. It's part of the body. And so therefore, uh, they're giving it this more ecological context. So instead of a pure solipsistic kind of mind, we now talk about the in inside and the outside worlds at the same time here. Again, though, there's that hint of dualism. So the behaviorist essentially then move to cross out the O and leave us with just the S and the R. Right? So we've gone from being a purely, purely mentalistic psychology to being uh, kind of a mind-body kind of interaction to then just getting rid of the mind entirely and we're left with just the body and the world. Right? We respond to the world without any mental processes and to intervene. And we'll talk about the details of how the behaviorists uh, describe that in the next chapter, but that's kind of the, the, the chain of, of events here. Now, other than that, we could say functionalism has effectively died out, but we might consider to recall back in chapter 10 that what Gibson was doing with ecological psychology, again, focusing on the importance of the environment uh, as providing information for perception, that Gibson could be considered a modern functionalist, maybe a neo-functionalist. Uh, and some historians have, in fact, called him that. And I would agree with that assessment. Uh, and in fact, his whole account of perception and action, uh, how we perceive in order to move and move in order to perceive, I think that very much is consistent with Dewey's take on the reflex arc, that we have to talk about stimulus and response as a part of a whole, instead of breaking them down, because Gibson says, we can't look at perception as a thing by itself and movement as a thing by itself, but rather they are integrated with each other and can only be understood as part of a whole. But of course, perception action is something that occurs in the environment, right? It occurs in response to the, to the environmental input, such as the optic array and the optic flow that provides information, and of course the, the affordances in the environment. Um, so if uh, if uh, modern trends are anything to be uh, interested in, uh, Gibson's approaches are gaining in popularity, and it might be that uh, functionalism could be ready for a comeback. But that's a debate for a later chapter. And that wraps up uh, chapter 12.